Big Beluga says, I cannot wait to learn. Good for you. Neither can I. Thank you. The hat is so fly. It's fun. I got the uh, the matching sunglasses too. But um, it won't really work with my glasses. But let's let's try this. Let's kind of get this strap. Oh boy, 3 p.m. It is 3 p.m. Okay, prepare yourself for the sunglasses combo. I'm blind right now, of course, because I don't have my glasses on. I don't have my contacts in. But this is the complete set piece. Odd question, do you play PC games? I like your mic on the boom stand. I haven't played PC games in a while. I, um, my favorite PC game ever is Warcraft 3, The Frozen Throne. And I still watch people, people play that competitively on Twitch. So I love Warcraft 3, but I, I don't play it anymore. Right now, I, I don't play too much. Um, I'm going through the Final Fantasy 7 remake. I'm really enjoying that. No spoilers, please. Um, what else am I playing? That, that's basically it right now. What did I play before that? Oh, uh, with my... Uh, a man of culture, yes. Very much so. I'm playing a game, uh, Hell, Hell Divers, with my brother and my brother-in-law. We might play a little bit of that tonight. Actually, my mom's getting into that game. So my mom wants to become a gamer because she wants to be able to play with her grandchildren someday. Um, so my sister has two little boys right now. Um, so they're too young to like really be into gaming, but my mom wants to be able to like jam with them in first person shooters or whatever. I mean, think about it, like video games five, 10 years from now, it, it, it's gonna be VR, right? I haven't played Half-Life Alex, but from what I saw of that, that seems game changing. You played it, it's freaking awesome. Um, yeah, it, it's like you can do anything in that game. I saw um, somebody was teaching a math class from Half-Life Alex because in the game they have whiteboard markers and so it's virtual reality. You can pick up a whiteboard marker and like write on a window in the game. And so, the this math teacher was streaming from within Half-Life Alex to teach a math class. Really cool. Really cool stuff. I can't wait to see where VR gaming goes. It'll make it so much more accessible. Because right now, like, my mom's learning to use a PlayStation 4 controller, and that's tough. Like, if you didn't grow up with a controller, it's really hard to figure it out. Like, it's intuitive for us. Um, I mean, I grew up with the PS1. What did you guys grow up with? PS3 or something. Nintendo 64, 
PS2 and the Wii, Game Boy and DS, GameCube, DS, PS1, oh man, Pokemon on the Game Boy Color, that sums up my childhood, um, actually, I didn't want it, so, Pokemon Blue and Red came out first for the super fat Game Boy, and my younger brothers played that, and I was like, ah, I'm not into Pokemon. But then by the time Pokemon Yellow came out, that story changed for me. That story changed. I was all about Pokemon. And then we had Pokemon Silver and Gold with the Game Boy Color. Holy cow. You played Emerald. So like the last Pokemon I played was Silver. Emerald. Oh man. Pokemon is Pokemon's great. Oh my goodness. My mom also plays Pokemon Go. She got into that recently. I haven't played that one yet. Although I'm I'm a big fan. I think that's a really cool concept. Are you guys ready to learn some flight dynamics today? We are quickly chugging along. So we're still at the border of some review content from Intermediate Dynamics, but we're really quickly gonna be hitting some new content. We're accelerating. So today we're gonna talk about combined rotational translational kinematics, how you can put that all together in one big differential equation and then we're going to finish today going back to transport theorem or the transport equation and I'm going to show you a different way of deriving the transport equation through an example so it's kind of cool to see I think so that's what we're going to do let's start with a little recap of what we're doing so we've been talking about the pose of an aircraft so that's a description of an aircraft's position and attitude and attitude just means orientation in space where is it pointing so in practice how do we get the pose well we recover the pose utilizing a combination of onboard and external sensors. So you might have inertial measurement units on the aircraft, but maybe you're also using radar. So it, in practice, you use a combination of onboard and external sensors, but we're just looking at how you can use onboard sensors right now. Um, so the specific measurements we're talking about, aircraft angular velocity, that's what we've been using um, on Monday. And today, we're gonna talk about how you use measurements of the aircraft inertial velocity as well. And maybe I should add in here, I'm talking about translational velocity. Wanna become famous? You seem like a bot. Okay, I gotta like ban you. Okay. So with angular velocity measurements and translational velocity measurements combined, we can completely recover the pose of the aircraft. So the position and the orientation. That's where we're going today. Now, before moving ahead, Let's review all the rotational kinematic results. We'll put them in a table here that you can refer to later. Okay. The first one we're gonna look at, Euler angles. Okay, so there are three Euler angles. We're gonna have phi, theta, 
and C. So those are the angles of these relative frames going from the fixed frame all the way to the body frame of the aircraft. So these are the parameters with which we describe attitude of an aircraft. If you have those three angles, you can describe its orientation. So here, I'm gonna give the kinematic equation for how we get that from sensor measurements. So we have this matrix, which is a function of the Euler angles. And if you're uh, curious about what the actual entries of this matrix are, just go back to our previous note set and I define this matrix. So you have this three by three matrix multiplied with the angular velocity vector from the body frame of the aircraft to the fixed frame. And this is going to be in array form where the components of this array are with respect to the B frame. So I know there's superscripts and subscripts flying all over the place, but the reason we use them is to be very explicit about uh, what we're defining things with respect to. So let's take this. I'm going to copy that. So this array is P, Q, and R. And these are the components of the aircraft angular velocity along the body frame axes. So this is what we're going to grab from onboard sensors. So some notes about this. We have here um, a collection of three differential equations. So this vector is three by one. Three differential equations to solve for our Euler angles. Now, if you want to solve this differential equation, you could use ODE 45. You could use Euler forward, whatever you want to do. But if you want to integrate this, you're going to need an initial condition to start. So let's define that. You're going to need our initial Euler angle. So that vector defined at time zero. And then you're going to need to keep getting this vector at subsequent instances in time. So you're going to be sampling this from a sensor on the aircraft. I don't know, a hundred times a second, maybe more. And that'll allow you to keep iterating on this differential equation and updating your Euler angles. So you can keep updating the attitude of the aircraft. Now there's a problem with the Euler angles, if you remember. So this differential equation has a divide by zero singularity. We showed that last time. Uh, specifically, when the theta, this like pitch angle, gets close to plus or minus 90 degrees. So however you define your fixed frame, if theta becomes plus or minus 90 degrees relative to that, excuse me, this differential equation becomes unstable and you're going to get garbage. This guy is talking bad things about you on his stream right now. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. So, so that's Euler angles. That's one way that we can express the attitude of an aircraft. We also introduced quaternions last time. So what are the quaternions? So it's this capital Q vector. Well, actually, let's write it. Let's fill in this one first. 
So there are four quaternions. Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And uh, these, these three, we call them the little Q hat vector. Or just little Q vector. So, so there's four of them. And this is this comes from um, Euler's principal rotation theorem. We talked about that a little bit last time, but it's just a a different way of thinking about the orientation of something. It's saying you can rotate one angle about a principal axis, so just one rotation to get into. Uh, starting from any arbitrary rotation and getting into a final rotation. So physically, that's what quaternions are talking about. So um, we can solve for the quaternions using sensor measurements from the aircraft once again. And it's the equation is going to look like this. So it's going to be one half times this matrix. So so this is just the time derivative of the quaternions. This is a four by one vector. These are the quaternions themselves. This is a four by one vector. Now this matrix, to make the sizes consistent, it's gonna be a four by four. And, and it looks like this. Um, there's a zero here. And then I'm gonna copy this from up here. because this angular velocity vector in the B frame shows up in this matrix. So I'm gonna kind of divide this into some quadrants here. So this is just a, a scalar zero, it's one by one. And then below that, we have this three by one vector. So if you remember, this is just gonna be P, Q, and R. And that's coming from a sensor on board the aircraft. Then if we take the transpose of that vector, so, so this right here, transpose, that'll be a one by three. So combined together, we have a zero and then laid right next to it, we have the angular velocity vector on its side. And then that leaves this last quadrant, which is gonna be a three by three matrix. And it's gonna use, I'm gonna zoom in here. It uses this S matrix that we talked about in class last time. So it's the S matrix of this angular velocity vector. And I'm gonna try to paste that in there, but squeeze it down. So if you're curious about the definition of that S matrix, just go back to the last set of notes. And in the video from Monday, we went into detail about how you get this S vector. Because somebody asked a really great question and we went through all the details of that but basically this s matrix is a way of expressing a cross product as a matrix okay anyways i'm trying to determine aircraft attitude i'm getting angular velocity measurements from a sensor on the aircraft with those angular velocity measurements i can populate this four by four matrix and that completes this differential equation for me. And then I can solve for the quaternions by integrating this. Okay, so let's, let's make some notes. If you want to determine attitude in this way, now you have four differential equations to solve to recover the quaternions. Now, whenever you integrate something, you need initial conditions. So you're gonna need the initial quaternion vector and then just like before, you're gonna continuously need these sensor measurements. 
Now, the great thing about Quaternions is there are no singularities. Which means you are safe to use this for any aircraft attitude. You don't have to worry about the orientation that the aircraft is in. And that's the appeal of using quaternions, especially for, for spacecraft dynamics where you may be pointing all over the place. Okay, we're going to do one more. And this we don't talk too much about because we don't use it that much. The good old directional cosines. So what am I talking about here? Another way of describing the attitude of an aircraft is using the cosines between the basis vectors of frame F and frame B. I think we talked about this matrix during week one. Oops, I forgot to put in the alphas here. Alpha one, three, two, one, two, 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 three, three, one, three, two, three, three. So with these nine parameters, you can also define the relative position of an aircraft or relative um, where it's pointing, its attitude. but it's it's nine parameters it's overkill and you can um we have a differential equation which i'm just going to give here so based on sensor measurements we can predict what this matrix will be as a function of time So we're bringing back this good old S matrix. Omega of wrong color B relative to my fixed frame expressed in B components. And then I have that three by three matrix operate on this three by three matrix. So this is a three by three. This is three by three. And this is three by three. So this is, this is a little different. It's, it's not returning a column vector. It's returning this entire matrix as a function of time uh, and that's part of why we we don't tend to use this we prefer using Euler angles or quaternions but let's take a couple notes about this so we're including this just to be complete so this actually turns out to be nine differential equations if you want to keep solving for this matrix at every cycle and once again, you're going to have to have this initial matrix. So whatever this is at time zero, and then you're going to recover these sensor measurements. So it, this does have one advantage over Euler angles in that there's no singularities. You can use this for any aircraft orientation, but um, it's much more work to use this. All right, so this is summarizing all of the attitude kinematics in our arsenal. 
Let's move on to the translational stuff now. Okay, so just like we use sensor measurements of the body angular rates, so these are P, Q, and R, to give us a differential equation to solve for the aircraft attitude. So we gave some different options up above. You can solve for the aircraft attitude in terms of the Euler angles or the quaternions. And I'm not even gonna mention the directional cosines because I just don't think we're gonna use that. So just like we can measure angular velocities to return the attitude, we're gonna use sensor measurements of the aircraft inertial velocity expressed in the body frame to give us a differential equation for position. And ultimately, we're gonna want this in fixed frame components. So we'll just call those X, Y, and Z. So we're gonna use measurements of velocity with respect to the body frame to recover the position relative to the fixed frame. Let us break it down step by step. Okay. So we have our fixed frame down here with an origin O. And then we have a position vector to the CG of the aircraft and it has a body frame fixed to it, right? Okay, so the position vector, let's write it out. The position from O to G expressed in the F frame, we're gonna call this X, Y, and Z. So some Cartesian coordinates to locate the CG of our aircraft. Um, now, notice it's kind of weird, but the Z direction for most aircraft applications, it points down. So uh, you could think of Z as the negative of the height. You know, because if this aircraft is flying like a kilometer up in the sky, its Z component, if it's going straight down, that'd be minus one kilometer. So you could just say, okay, minus Z is the height of my aircraft. I'm not totally sure why they have Z going down, but it's the same thing that we use for road vehicles. We have Z going down. Okay, so we know we can express the position of the aircraft in B coordinates as well. So the way you do that is you take that position vector What did I just do? That position vector with respect to the F frame and you just have to multiply it by a rotation matrix from F to B. Now, it's worth pointing out here, this rotation matrix, it's gonna be a function of, depending on what parameters you're using, your Euler angles, or it could be a function of quaternions. So in, in order to do this transformation, you have to know the attitude of the aircraft at, at that time. Okay, so these, uh, it's dependent on knowing the attitude. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, so let's talk about the inertial velocity of the aircraft. If we have a position vector, what is the inertial velocity. So when we say inertial velocity, it's the time derivative of the position vector with respect to the fixed frame, F. But just like we can express 
the position also in B-frame coordinates, we can express this inertial velocity in F or B-frame coordinates. So let's let's show that here. Okay, so inertial velocity. That's, and we'll introduce some notation here. This will be very similar to what you used in intermediate dynamics with Dr. Daryl. So we got the position vector. Um, G, the CG relative to, oops. Oh. And this time derivative is with respect to the fixed frame. So I'm an observer just sitting in place on the ground watching how this position vector changes relative to me. So for shorthand notation, we call this the velocity of the CG of the aircraft relative to the fixed origin from the perspective of the fixed frame. So this superscript means with respect to fixed frame. So you could write this out in F in fixed frame coordinates. Maybe I'll just put those coordinates first. So it'll be FX, FY, and FZ. So this would be x dot plus y dot plus z dot. But if it's in, if we express it in the B frame, bx, by, bz, we use this notation for aircraft. I can hear an ice cream truck going by outside in front of my place. It reminds me that summer is ending, fall is quickly approaching. Uh, remember, we call this type of notation basis vector notation. Let's put this in array notation. So I'm going to take this. Actually, I need that superscript too. So the velocity of G with respect to O as observed from the fixed frame expressed in F frame components. Now I know there's just superscripts upon superscripts and subscripts. So that is array notation for the inertial velocity of G with respect to O expressed in F frame coordinates. That's a mouthful. Okay, let's do the same thing for the B frame. Okay, so it's still the inertial velocity just expressed in B frame coordinates. U, V, W. And I want to point out, this is the vector we get from sensors on board the aircraft.
What happened to the good old yaw pitch roll? What do you mean? I mean, it's still like, um, well, yaw pitch and roll, those are rotations about the body frame axes, right? But now we're talking about. No, 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 no. We use, we definitely use those terms. But right now I'm talking about translational velocities, which uh, like yaw pitch and roll are rotations. So these right now are, it's just moving along a line. And it's using yaw pitch and roll. It's um, you got to be careful too, because. If we're talking about, can you explain? Okay, I'll finish my thought. We have to be careful uh, when we're talking about rotations, whether they are Euler angle rates or body rates. So we mentioned last time that the angular velocity with respect to the body frame, we have PQR, right? And we call those the body angular rates. These are not the same as the Euler angle rates, which are with respect to intermediate frames. So we're really driving home the notation here that like, when somebody says like pitch rate, like, well, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the body rate? Are you talking about the Euler angle rate? Um, okay, can you explain the difference between the F superscript and the F subscript meaning on the left-hand side? I would love to. Okay, so let's break this up. So actually, let's start here because th this subscript that's to the left, this superscript to the left, this means that the time derivative is with respect to the frame in that superscript. So when I'm talking about an inertial velocity that inertial velocity is the velocity as observed from a fixed frame so i'm calculating that time derivative from that fixed frame that's what that left superscript means now this is different from this subscript on the right this subscript is saying and we only use this when we do array notation, but it's saying these elements in the array are with respect to the F frame. Because if I didn't have, let's say I didn't have this, and I just give you a vector, and I say that vector is the inertial velocity. Well, depending on which basis the components are with respect to like how do you know if that's with respect to the b frame or the f frame you wouldn't so this makes it clear that so this basically makes the connection to basis vector notation Th does that clear it up for you And we're gonna we're gonna use this notation over and over and over again, so it's um, we'll drive it home with repetition. Okay. Yeah, guys, feel free to stop me at any point and be like, superscripts are flying around. What the heck are we doing? Okay. So, just like. You can transform um, between position vectors. You can transform between um, velocity vectors using a rotation matrix. So we're going to go, in this case, from B to F. So that's the relationship between these components
And it turns out that this right here is a differential equation. And let me show you how. So remember this vector, the inertial velocity, inertial meaning relative to a fixed frame, then expressed in F frame coordinates, we define that as X dot, Y dot, and Z dot. So it's the first derivative of the position vector components with respect to the F frame. And this vector on the right, U, V, W. These are the components that I'm reading from onboard sensors from the aircraft. So I relate these with a rotation matrix. Okay, now, now we're gonna start to combine some things in a second. Now, and, and this is why we drove home all this rotational stuff first, because this rotation matrix, you can use your attitude parameters of choice. Like if you like Euler angles, then we showed that, this is the rotation matrix in terms of Euler angles. So you could do that if you're using Euler angles or if you're like, no, 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 no. I love me my quaternions. Okay, sure. Use that rotation matrix in terms of quaternions. Our quaternions is commonplace in that field as our matrices. Well, I would say that even if something's in terms of quaternions, we are going to ultimately put it in an array form and propagate it in that way. I know there's like some efficient quaternion math, um, but we're just gonna use array notation. Oh, and note the um, the transpose up here, because when we derived these matrices earlier, we were going from F to B. So in other words, like before we derived these from F to B. And so I have to take the transpose of this to get the B to F that is required for this equation up here. So I've made that mistake a lot. So when you're doing homework and some things coming out like, whoa, I do not understand what I'm getting here. Uh, make sure that it's um, in the correct configuration. Maybe you have to transpose it. Okay, so this is the differential equation you can solve to recover the position of the aircraft, but the rotation matrix is dependent on attitude parameters. So let me show you how you put all of this together. Combined rotational and translational kinematics. We have to do both of them together because they're dependent on one another. Okay, so equipped with measurements of the body angular rates as well as the inertial velocity with respect to the body frame, we can build a kinematic differential equation that fully determines the pose of an aircraft, position and attitude. So we're gonna build this combined thing. Let's say you wanna use Euler angles. All right. Uh, so we just derived this relationship, x dot, y dot, z dot to u, v, and w, right? So we know that I need the rotation matrix from B to F to go here. 
and just so to make it really clear that's three by three now that equation doesn't depend on the angular velocity sensor measurements so I'm gonna put a zero here a zero matrix actually three by three and then filling this out this is what we described at the beginning of class today we have a different differential equation to recover these um, the Euler angles and they do depend on the angular velocity measurements and we derived this E matrix that goes in here and this E matrix is a function of the Euler angles themselves so I'll just say you know I'll just keep reminding you like this is how exactly did I define it which one was on top is it phi? Yeah, phi theta. Oh yeah, it should be the same as this over here. And then um, these Euler angle rates don't depend on the velocity measurements so we have a zero there so this differential equation you solve to get x y z which is the position and you'll also recover the Euler angles so you're gonna get position you're gonna get attitude and we know that together, that's called the pose. And I mentioned this before, but you're going to be using this on the next homework. What homework do you have right now? Homework three? Homework four, we're going to give you these sensor measurements from a quadcopter. EH. Yes. Thank you. Or E... Uh, I see what you're saying. This is three by three. E of big theta vector. That's a three by three. So we got a six by six matrix. All right. What if you want to use quaternions? We have a slightly different equation here. Not too much different. Now, we got a seven by one here. What is E of theta exactly? Let me show you really quick. Cause we did this last time. Um, where'd you go my friend? Here it is. So that's from note set five. I posted that, right? If I didn't, I'll do that very soon. But yeah, it's it's um it's a matrix, it's a function of the Euler parameters. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you very much. So that three by three is gonna go in there in the bottom right. Okay. So uh, to start this matrix off, it's going to look the same over here. So, okay, this is three by three. We know that. The dimensions of this are, they can be a little tricky. To make this matrix equation work out, overall, this has to be a seven by seven. You multiply a seven by seven with a seven by one, it returns a seven by one. So I know that. So over here has to be a zero matrix, but it's going to have to be three by four. Now the quaternion kinematic equation. So this is 
once again like big q dot this is big q I'm gonna call the matrix that relates this equation, I'll also call it E, but it's a function of, I'm just, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make this easy. It's a function of P, Q, and R. And it is four by four. Now, if you wanna see the definition of this matrix, it's also in the OneNote's previous. Let's pull that up as well, just to give you a quick glance at it. And I defined it uh, in this note set as well. But if you want to see it really clear, oops, it's this. It's one half times this. So like you see a zero here. Here's the angular velocity vector with respect to the B frame. Here's the negative of the transpose. And then we got um, this like S matrix. So anyways, that's what this four by four matrix is. And then down here in the bottom left, I got to make a, a four by three matrix full of zeros to round this out. So this, this quaternion equation, it works the same way. You get sensor measurements U, V, and W. And you also get sensor measurements P, Q, and R, but those sensor measurements appear in the matrix over here. You'll get a chance to really hash this out with the homework. It'll be good practice. You'll see how everything connects together. I think this 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 homework's really fun. Like, um, you might not always feel that way if you get stuck somewhere, but but by the end, it's really satisfying to say like, look, I have real measurements from a device flying around in the air, and I'm using mathematics to predict where it is in space and where it's pointing. And you'll see this works very accurately. So, with these tools you can go out in the world and do a lot of things. I think this is a really valuable set of equations right here. Okay. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit because starting next week, we're leaving the world of kinematics. Well, we won't be totally leaving, but we're going into the world of dynamics, which depends on kinematics, but... Um, Anyways, the transport equation, we're going to use that a lot. Or you might have heard it called transport theorem. But this is going to become really useful for us in the coming weeks. Maybe a silly question, but how does wind speed come into that? The airplane sensors used to only be able to measure their relative speed. Um, no, that's, that's true. Like these... I'm gonna have to get back to you on that because these sensors, UV and W, are a, when we get into the dynamics, these are gonna be relative speed. And we're gonna make the assumption in this class that you don't really have a headwind. Um, so in that case, U, V, and W, if there's no headwind, the relative speed will be the inertial speed as well, if you know what I mean. But that, that's a very good question. I have to get back to you on that. And, and yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Okay. The transport equation. So... This allows us to relate the time derivative of a vector relative to the fixed frame 
to the time derivative of that same vector relative to the B frame, where these frames are moving relative to one another. I know that's a mouthful. We're gonna show some examples that hopefully make it a little, um, a little more clear what that's saying. But right out of the gate, I'm gonna give you the transport equation and then um, we're gonna do an example that shows where this comes from. Okay, so this is, okay. We're now saying that definition with math. So let's just say there's a vector R and I'm taking the time derivative of that from the perspective of this fixed frame, F. Well, that's equal to the time derivative. Now I'm gonna use a, a, a B frame superscript. So now let's say I'm on the B frame and I'm sitting on the aircraft, so I'm moving with the aircraft. What does the time derivative of that R vector look like from my perspective? It's gonna be different than if you were sitting on the ground, right? Okay, so this is how the two are related to each other. You take the angular velocity from B to F, and you take the cross product of that with the vector. So it's the time derivative of R from two different observers. And this is how we can relate the two together through this cross product. So we'll do a, an example later on to show where this comes from. Okay, so for example, say we wanna calculate the velocity of point P on the aircraft below relative to the fixed point O. Let me show you this figure. So let's say P is just hanging out on the end of the, the left wing. So let's say I want to calculate the velocity of that point, okay? So let's start with the position. The position of P relative to O, well first let's calculate the position of the CG relative to O. So we wanna get the position all the way from P to O, but we're gonna start with this vector. And then we're gonna to add to it this position vector from, um, oops. from the CG of the aircraft to P. So we're adding those two vectors together to get that vector from P to O. So the inertial velocity of point P would be the time derivative of that position vector with respect to the fixed frame F. That's what inertial velocity means. It's from the perspective of the fixed frame. So I'm kind of uh, filling in some of that here. So the velocity of P relative to O relative to the fixed frame, well, we know that's the time derivative of the position vector from the perspective of that fixed frame. Let's substitute in here the that little vector summation that we that we got up here. And this will show why the transport equation becomes useful in this sort of situation. So p relative to o, it's g relative to o plus p relative to g. And then you can break these up.
So I'm just separating these. The time derivative of the addition of them is the same as the separate time derivatives adding them together. Okay, now this vector P relative to G, remember point P is just sitting on the end of the left wing. That would be easiest to describe in body frame coordinates, right? Because you could just say it's, um, you know, it's always in the same place relative to the body frame. It's like however many meters off the left side of the plane, no matter what orientation the plane is in. I would be crazy to express that position vector relative to the fixed frame because that's always going to be like changing all over the place. So I, it makes my life easier to express that in the body frame. Um, but the problem is now if I express this in body frame coordinates, I'm going to be taking the derivative of it with respect to a different frame than the components are. And, and that's where transport theorem is going to help. Okay, so let's... Here we go. So what you would do in that case, if you had this in body frame coordinates, you would apply transport theorem. So I'm just rewriting it from up above. I would take the time derivative of that vector with respect to the B frame. All right, let's copy this. Which if that point is if that point is fixed to the body frame, then this time derivative is gonna to go to zero anyways, if it's something fixed to the body. And then you take the angular velocity vector of B relative to the fixed frame, and you take the cross product of that with that vector. So this is a situation where transport equation shows up. Um, but it's sometimes I think it's a little weird to say that like, like why is this angular velocity vector here? Why is, why is there a cross product? Um, there's some physical explanations for this, but it's, it's never a very simple explanation. So there's a way of showing it mathematically um, that I just saw recently. And I think this is a kind of cool way of looking at it. So I don't know if this was, might be new to you, but we'll go through it. So, okay. Understanding the transport equation. There are different ways of deriving it. Um, but I'm going to show this simple 2D example and try to show where that expression comes from. So, okay, this is, this is gonna be a little bit different than what we were looking at before, but let's say we have a pilot sitting at point P uh, in the cockpit here. And I wanna get the velocity of that pilot relative to the fixed frame. So it, it's different than just the velocity of the center of gravity. Now let's assume that this aircraft, it, it's moving and you know it has some pitch rate, like the nose is moving up. So there's relative rotation of these two frames. Okay. So we'll break this down just like we did last time. Oh, I'm getting a call from my grandma right now. I have to hang up on her. Okay. <laughs> have you ever hung up on your grandma? Okay. So, point P relative to O. It's this um, addition. We start with G relative to O. and then P relative to G. 
Oh, I did the wrong color for G. All right, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make an assumption here. I'm just gonna define some variables. Let's say from the perspective of the body frame of the aircraft, the pilot is a distance XB along the BX direction and a distance ZB along BZ. So let's say I have that measurement at this time. And I'm gonna assume that the angular velocity of the B frame relative to the F frame, it's just um, theta dot. It's purely doing some planar pitching. So we're just trying to make that angular velocity pretty simple. All right, so now let's derive the velocity of the pilot relative to the fixed frame. And you could use the transport equation right away to do this, but um, I'm gonna more derive the transport equation through this example. So here we go, here we go. We'll start with this. I know that the derivative of this position vector And break it up. Let's just write this out. Okay. P relative to G. So really th this is the term that we're gonna be concerned with here because this we have its components relative to the body frame, the position of the pilot relative to the CG of the aircraft. Uh, first I'm gonna take this and for the rest of the problem we're, we're just gonna say, look, I know that this is the velocity of the CG relative to O with respect to the fixed frame. And we're not gonna do anything more with it. However, this This we're going to do some work on. So the first thing I want to do, I want to substitute in the components with respect to the B frame. So this is, I said it was XB along the BX direction and then ZB along the BZ direction. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start doing this time derivative with respect to the F frame using the product rule. So we know we could use the transport theorem to do this, but I'm, I'm not going to do it yet. Okay, so what would this be? So it would be the time derivative of XB. times bx and then here's where the product rule comes in xb times ddt with respect to the f frame of this bx vector so this is the time derivative with respect to the f frame for um, this XB along the BX direction, all right? And 
And then for the other term, I'm going to recycle this writing that I just did and just adjust it. So instead of XB, it's ZB dot. This has to be ZB. And BZ. Okay, so the, the concern here is, what is this? The derivative of these basis vectors in the B frame with respect to that fixed frame, somebody just sitting on the ground observing this aircraft in the sky. Um, so this is the interesting part. So pay attention here. From, because we played around with this geometry before. And so I'm gonna give you this result. The relationship between the basis vectors of B and F. So BX is cosine theta times the FX basis vector. Should the ZB dot term have a BZ next to it or is it supposed to be bx oh thank you so much because you were you're actually you're absolutely right you're absolutely right this should be a bz when i was copying things over i got a little lazy thank you okay so we got this and then it's minus sine theta F Z and it doesn't have an F Y component. So I'm just ignoring that. <clears throat> so let's do this. Now that we expressed B in terms of F frame components, let's try to calculate this. The time derivative of it with respect to the F frame, because now it's in the F frame. So here I'm going to use the, the product rule again. So if you take the time derivative of cosine theta, you're going to get, well, theta dot, okay, minus theta dot sine theta. So that's the time derivative of cosine theta. That's going to be multiplied by fx. And then using the product rule here, I'll have plus cosine theta times the time derivative with respect to the F frame of the basis vector Fx. Let's come back to that. Because we'll, we'll finish... Um, differentiating the whole thing. So now let's move on to the sine term. Why do you need to use the product rule for BX? Is it because BX is changing over time? Yes. Yes, it is changing over time. Because BX is the vector pointing out the nose of this plane. And generally th that can move around relative to the fixed frame. Oops. Okay. All right, so we're differentiating BX with respect to the F frame. So this, when I take the time derivative, it becomes that. So now we need the next term. So the time derivative of sine theta, that's gonna be minus theta dot cosine theta fz and then minus sine theta I'm going to copy this ddt now this is fz okay so the special thing is we know that the time derivative 
of an f basis vector with respect to the f frame is going to be zero because if i'm just sitting say on the origin of the f frame those basis vectors are just sitting on the ground with me they're not changing so then we find that the time derivative of the b basis basis vector with respect to f all right let's let's keep going with this it's going to be minus theta dot because they they share this theta dot term in common um sine theta fx plus cosine theta theta fc okay but check this out oh shoot i didn't write it down let's write it down now so the BZ basis vector is, where'd you go, my friend? So this is something that we derived before as well for this specific example. Sine theta FX plus cosine theta FZ. And if you look carefully, this is exactly the same as the vector in parentheses here. So it turns out the derivative of bx with respect to the f frame is minus theta dot, but I don't want this in pink, minus theta dot times bz okay so I'll be able to take this and substitute it in up here now to save time I'm going to give you the time derivative of, of BZ next, because you can do the same procedure that we did for BX. And you're going to find the time derivative with respect to the F frame of BZ. is theta dot bx okay let's put this all together and then you'll see where the cross product comes through as well recycle this and let's take this too lest we forget sometimes you get so deep in the math you forget what you were calculating that happens to me we're calculating the derivative of the position of the pilot relative to the CG of the plane, but from an observer at the fixed frame. And so you expand it out like this. And just to save time, it breaks my heart, but I'm, I'm not going to switch colors right now. So I'm gathering some of these terms. I gathered these two together. And then I know that, um, so let's just make that clear. 
and then I'm gonna have XB times the D DT with respect to the B frame of BX. What was that? So that was minus theta BZ. And then I'm gonna have plus ZB times theta BX. Okay, um, but where are the cross products? Because transport theorem has this angular velocity cross product. All right, let me show you. Um, if you remember the cross product relationship, okay, so thinking about BZ as a cross product, the way I would get it is I would do BX crossed into BY. Like I would follow this direction and recover BZ. Oh, but I need, neg I need negative BZ. So if I want negative BZ, I would have to switch this. I need BY cross BX. Because of that negative sign. And then if I want BX, I have to do BY cross BZ. All right, so just one more minute here. I know I, I want to respect your guys' time, but this will be a cool result, I think. ZB, BZ. So now I'm going to substitute in this. XB. Wait, we're going to divide this out a little bit. BY cross so this term has become this oh that should be a plus sign and then we have y cross z b b z so this term has become this This theta dot b y is the angular velocity of the b frame with respect to the f frame. So same thing here. So this equals x b dot b x plus z b dot b z plus the angular velocity of the b frame with respect to the f frame crossed with, you can add these two together, XBBX plus ZBBZ. And this is just the position vector from G to P. And this is just the time derivative of that position vector with respect to the B frame. So you end up with the transport theorem. So this is, this is another way of deriving the transport theorem and showing how it relates the time derivative of something in two different coordinate systems. Um, and that's where we're going to leave off. I know we blasted through quite a bit of material today. You might be feeling a little math fatigue at this point. Oops. I know I am. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention. Do we have office hours today? Let me check. What day is it? It's Wednesday.
I can't remember if I have road vehicle office hours or flight office hours. Oh, no. Okay, it's a road vehicle office hours day. But Saeed is available for office hours today. So if you head over there at 4.30, he's going to be there to take any questions you have on the most recent homework. And I'll hang out here for just like a couple more minutes before I got to run at 4.30. Thank you guys for your attention today. Thank you for your questions. Um, thanks for pointing out little errors to me. I appreciate that. But I hope you're having a good Wednesday. All right, see you later, my friend.